The term blackballed means that you've been ousted from some group and perhaps even excluded from consideration for entry before you can even become involved. It can also mean that you've been shunned or outcast, maybe taken advantage of in a deal. The history of this term is actually stunningly literal. A few hundred years ago, think 16th and 17th century, Organizations like the Freemasons and private gentlemen's clubs would accept new members or elect their governing bodies by using a ballot box. What we call ballots today, however, were originally called ballot papers, as the word ballot referred to white and black balls about the size of marbles, which would be plonked down into a closed box with a hole in it to cast one's vote. The setup would usually include a large number of black and white balls next to the box, so that no one need carry their own, which could result in evidence as to who voted what. And in some cases, curtains were used to block the view of how each person voted, though you could still be certain that they did, and only once, because of the sound the ball made when dropped through the hole into the box. The outcome of the elections could be immediately seen when the box was opened, as white balls would mean roughly yay, while the black balls would mean nay, meaning the black balls would represent dissent against someone's elevation to power or acceptance into the group. And typically it only took a single, or in some cases, a pair of black balls to prevent someone from attaining power or membership. The idea was to provide a mechanism for assessing the general opinion of people in a close-knit group without any member having to publicly voice their opinion, which could perhaps cause infighting or hurt feelings or other negative long-term consequences. To be blackballed, then, was to be voted against, to have a black ball cast against you. It was to be excluded from the group or voted down from potential power. The modern usage of the term blackball, though, is sometimes more akin to being blacklisted. Blacklisted is a term that originates around the same time as blackballed in the 17th century, and it seems to have first been used in a play called The Unnatural Combat by Philip Massinger. In the context of this play, the blacklist was a list of names of judges and other officials who had presided over the trial and subsequent execution of King Charles I. These officials were targeted for punishment by his successor, King Charles II, after the monarchy was restored about a decade later. A blacklist in this context, then, was a far more serious thing than simply being excluded, but the modern meaning usually implies someone who is being intentionally shunned or denied access to something, which is an implication that is often shared by the modern usage of the term blackballed. Today, I want to start with an article that involves a blacklist or a blackballing. We're also going to get into trade-offs and costs in the context of technological and societal development. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you're hearing, consider stopping by letsknowthings.com. There you will find a contribute page with a list of different ways that you can help support the show. The standard helpful acts like going to iTunes and leaving a review or recommending the show to a friend or contributing monetarily, directly, but also some more obscure options like doing your shopping through an Amazon link that is provided there. Any and all contributions of this kind are very much appreciated, and a huge thanks to everyone who has already contributed in some way, shape, or form already. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. HostGator is the hosting company that I have very gladly used for many, many years. 
And if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will receive a substantial discount on their already very reasonable prices. And the other sponsor today is Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free month of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice from their extensive collection. Stay tuned till the end of the episode, and I will give a recommendation for a book that you might consider using that credit on. All right, let's get back to the show. So the article I'm going to unspool today comes from Vox.com, and it's entitled, Uber has a secret program to foil law enforcement. So apparently, potential Uber riders, people who have the app and an account on the service, who were suspected of being law enforcement or other city officials, would be blacklisted by the app so that when they logged in to the Uber app, they would be shown a fake map with fake cars on it, and their rides would be canceled soon after they booked them. So they could use the app and they could book a car through it, but everything that would be taking place within that app would be a fake version of how everyone else's app operates. And this feature, by the way, was internally referred to as grayballing. And grayballing was implemented in an effort to prevent law enforcement officials from booking Uber cars and then pressing charges against the drivers, since that was very often law enforcement's only option in places where Uber was against the law or on the fringe of being against the law. Uber was careful to never call itself a taxi or a cab service and therefore could not be easily targeted by the taxi industry regulations that were being enforced, while the drivers, on the other hand, could. And so the app allowed law enforcement a very easy way of pulling in drivers and then pressing charges against them, while Uber the company remained separate from that and above a lot of the charges that would otherwise be pressed. This positioning as not a taxi company has proven to be a huge competitive advantage for Uber, and it has allowed them to portray themselves as an app that helps drivers provide a car service rather than as a business that hires drivers to fulfill that service. That framing allows them to pay drivers as freelancers and not as employees which is another face of the mountain of legal challenges under which the company is currently being buried in many places around the world. Now, from the Vox article, quoting Uber's statement on the subject of grayballing after they were caught, quote, This program denies ride requests to users who are violating our terms of service, whether that's people aiming to physically harm drivers, competitors looking to disrupt our operations, or opponents who collude with officials on secret stings meant to entrap drivers, end quote. And again, from the Vox article, quote, Enforcement officials involved in large-scale sting operations to catch Uber drivers also sometimes bought dozens of cell phones to create different accounts. To circumvent that tactic, Uber employees went to that city's local electronics stores to look up device numbers of the cheapest mobile phones on sale, which were often the ones bought by city officials whose budgets were not sizable, end quote. So all this looks pretty bad for Uber. There's no way around that, really. Every single step of this process and every component of this grayballing scheme and every effort to avoid city officials, although it may be justifiable from some perspectives and in some ways, it, it still looks bad. And having this information land in the same month and in the same week in some cases as a slew of other stories about Uber and its scandal-ridden CEO, Travis Kalanick, was not good for the company's public image. Now, these other articles, these other stories that have emerged about Uber just in 2017, and in many cases just in February of 2017, 
include headlines like, A viral blog post is forcing Uber to address its sexism problem. Google is suing Uber for allegedly stealing a key self-driving car technology. Uber's CEO lectures a driver about quote-unquote responsibility in an argument about fair cuts. And just today, the, the day that I'm recording this, an article came out with the headline, Uber is forcing drivers in Seattle to listen to anti-union propaganda. And the story there is that apparently Seattle's Uber drivers are toying with the idea of forming a union, and Uber there recorded a podcast series which is steeped in anti-union propaganda that it is forcing the drivers to listen to each day before they can get to work. And those issues that I just listed also come in the wake of a bunch of public flack that Uber has taken for apparently breaking a taxi strike that took place back in January of 2017, when the Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States executive order, which is often referred to as Trump's Muslim ban or Trump's refugee ban, came suddenly into effect, preventing many people from entering the U.S. The strike that took place included the participation of New York cabbies who refused to pick people up from JFK International Airport in New York as part of a demonstration against the ban. So no taxis at JFK Airport, that is a huge deal, that is a very effective means of protesting. But Uber drivers swooped in to fill the gaps in service for the people arriving at the airport, and Uber, the company, dropped their usual surge pricing scheme for the time in which these cabbies were protesting, which would typically increase the cost of a ride when demand is high in a given area, but consequently left the prices at their usual rate. Some people, especially the cab drivers and other protesters, perceived this move as very cold-blooded, while others tied it to Kalanick's presence on President Trump's economic advisory board, seeing it as not just a cold-blooded business move, but a conscious ideological effort to undermine the cabbie strike and, in fact, support the travel ban. Whatever the reality of that case might have been, the effort to send in Uber drivers to fill the needs of these new arrivals at JFK Airport backfired spectacularly, leading to a massive online pushback against the company, which centralized around the delete Uber hashtag, which encouraged Uber users to delete their accounts and to delete the app from their phones. According to a New York Times article that came out a few days later, in the aftermath of much of this pushback, over 200,000 Uber users deleted their accounts as a result of this post-protest protest. A number that was so staggering, by the way, that Uber had to build a new mechanism for users to delete their accounts en masse. Whereas before, having an account deleted was so unusual that it required manual help from a customer service representative to make that happen. Kalanick is reported to have left Trump's advisory board at the beginning of February, partly because of this protest and partly because of an internal rebellion from his own employees who pressured him to step back from apparent public alignment with a ban that was proving to be so unpopular. The company's name had become stigmatizing for those who worked at the company. They were becoming embarrassed to work for Uber and were even experiencing pushback in their own lives from their family and friends. But it was also something that many of them felt personally negative about because they were immigrants themselves or they were close friends or family with immigrants. Ride-sharing competitor brand Lyft saw an opportunity for differentiation in the ride-sharing space as all of this was happening. And despite them also having provided rides from JFK Airport that night, though without removing their own surge pricing, they decided to double down on their perceived contrast with Uber by announcing a donation of $1 million to the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, 
which is the nonprofit that has made the most noise and provided the most on the ground pushback against the travel ban. Lyft made this announcement in the midst of the height of the delete Uber hashtag popularity, which added even more weight to what seems to have already been a very serious pile on against Uber. Now, any single one of these issues would have been a spectacular PR nightmare for any company. But Uber seems to wake up from that type of bad dream more quickly than most other companies. Now, this is a brand that since its birth in 2009 has attracted scandal and raised discord with essentially everything it's ever done. The way we perceive each overstep on their part is at least partially determined by who we are by our individual politics, and by how much we are willing to read into intent separate from actions. Some people, for instance, might find the legal and economic ramifications of Uber's upending the taxi and automobile industries to be the main issue in how they operate of what they do. Others might be more disconcerted by the casual aggression demonstrated by executives at the company toward journalists and regulators. This includes a highly publicized instance in which an Uber senior executive suggested that tech journalists should be followed and investigated by the company so they could essentially be blackmailed if they ever thought about saying something mean about Uber. And they thought about doing the same to governmental employees who might be thinking about passing laws or regulations that could hurt Uber's bottom line. For some people, the really disconcerting thing is Kalanick's womanizing and casual disdain for social mores. But for others, it's the seeming lack of consideration for any needs beyond those of this one company and its full throttle seemingly blind pursuit of its own ambitions. The fact that there's so much about this one company to get so upset about for both the empathetic crowd and the calculating, cold business big picture thinkers has made these issues into a larger super issue of a sort that the company is no longer able to ignore. As I record this, Kalanick is still CEO of Uber, but he has made apologetic statements and has promised to hire a second-in-command who he says will help keep him in line. Whether that turns out to be the case or not is relevant to the story of Uber, but not quite as relevant to a question that I want to ask, which I think is central to the world of ride-sharing, but also to drivers of change and to movement in every other sphere, from tech to social movements to politics. And that question is this. At what cost. I ask this question quite seriously, not rhetorically. I ask it because I think it's a question with answers that are not yet clear, that are not foregone conclusions. I ask because I know that although I may not approve of the personality traits of someone like Travis Kalanick, and I might not agree with everything that Uber does internationally to increase their perceived brand value, and to create hurdles for any competitors that might challenge them. But I also recognize that they have changed the world, and in my mind, for the better. I like that there are options for travel that do not require me to own and maintain and store a car, but that also provide greater flexibility than walking and most mass transit options. They've created a new product category that, although is very similar to traditional taxis in some ways, is still far different in many other important ways. I think ride-sharing, for all its flaws, is a brilliant use of the technologies involved. I think, like the folks at Uber seem to think, that the ride-sharing industry is one of the more ideal birthing canals for autonomous car technology. If Uber has the resources to purchase a million autonomous cars in one fell swoop, and if they can get those cars on roads around the world, that will massively incentivize autonomous car companies to produce better products and will get self-driving cars on the market faster, expanding the market like crazy in a very short period of time. 
And it will also hasten the shift from a society in which everyone has to own their own car toward one in which we can prioritize access over ownership. From multiple standpoints, then, environmental, urban design, social, economic, this is a shift that makes a whole lot of sense. It's a move that represents a whole lot of wins in spaces that I care about, and it's one of the more easily attainable, just-over-the-horizon manifestations of those types of concepts. It could happen tomorrow, theoretically, with currently available technologies and with some willing regulators. We just need someone who's willing to take the risks and make some heavy initial investments. But at the same time, I can't help but cringe that it's these people, these specific smarmy ass individuals, but also this company with its reputation and apparent motivations that seem to be in the best position to make these changes happen in a reasonable time frame. I want my heroes to be people I can feel good about rooting for. But in this case, I find for my beliefs and values, at least, I am comfortable cheering for the movement, but not the movers. I love what's possible and what's happening, but I don't like those who are making those possibilities happen. The really sticky issue is that this unfortunate combination of achievement and personality is not unique to Uber or ride-sharing. Many visionaries are assholes. Many heroes in one aspect of life are villains in another. It's safe to guess that many otherwise brilliant, productive human beings have also been spousal abusers and racists. Many globe-shaking revolutionaries have also casually littered and failed to tip their waiter. Confusing the issue further, since we all have different ideas about good and bad, and the nature of brilliance, what makes a person wonderful or horrible will differ, depending on who you ask. To you, that a peacemaker takes the Lord's name in vain may balance them out to a state of moral neutrality. To your neighbor... A CEO whose company invests in blood diamond harvesting or strip mining may still be a predominantly positive force in the world, so long as their efforts lead to cheaper gas at the pump and more beautiful gemstones at the jeweler. The question, at what cost, then, is about how far is too far and how the good and the bad balance each other out. It may be that one moat of ignobility is enough to poison the well for you and your ideology. Or it may be that sexism and economic good are two equivalent metrics that actually can cancel each other out, if you do the measuring correctly. Is it ideal that a misogynist is also a powerful business person? Probably not. But what if that misogynist also manages to create a clean energy revolution, saving the world from dramatic cataclysmic climate change? It becomes a lot trickier to wholeheartedly criticize at that point, I think, or at least without a bunch of asterisks connected to a multitude of clarifying footnotes. Trump said something during the 2016 U.S. presidential election that was very interesting to me, in part because he said it so brazenly and clearly and without decoration, and partially because it was so widely celebrated by many people who you might not expect to take kindly to such a statement. During the first debate of that election, Hillary Clinton talked about how Trump had not released his tax returns, which went against a tradition that had stood for 40 years. She then said, among other things, that he may not be releasing them because they would show that he doesn't pay federal taxes like normal people do. As she made this last point, Trump interjected, saying, quote, that makes me smart, end quote. What he said there is something that everyone knows, but very few people are willing to speak openly about and to speak clearly about. That wealthy people often pay very little in taxes relative to middle class and poor people is a somewhat taboo subject. And even more taboo is the fact that the U.S. tax system is set up in such a way that they are able to do so legally. Now, is it the intent 
of the tax system of the U.S. to make the rich richer and the poor poorer, to take more from one group who cannot afford it and to take less from another group that can. No, not really, not structurally, not at first at least, if you go back to the foundations of the system. But over the generations, small and large additions to the tax code have added numerous loopholes, some of which are clever little manipulations that you really have to look for and which border on illegality, and others are well-known gateways that you simply need to walk through without any effort at all. But although the vast majority of wealthy people make use of these opportunities, very few are willing to talk about them openly and clearly and without obfuscation, because taking advantage of such loopholes feels like an abuse of the system. Yes, it is technically legal, but it doesn't seem fair. It's a structural advantage that the wealthy have over the non-wealthy, and that's not how it's supposed to work, in theory. But even if you don't believe that advantage should exist, why wouldn't you take advantage of these loopholes if you're able to? Are you going to tell your CPA not to help you keep more of your money purely on principle? And what principle would that be, anyway? The principle that you think the government will spend your money better than you can? Or maybe just the principle that all people should be held to the same standards no matter what? Even if that means you're leaving money on the table as a protest that doesn't actually change anything? Even if you hold radical beliefs about wealth and equality, I think most interpretations of this situation would be that it is probably better to use these loopholes when you find them. The only situation I can think of in which it almost always makes sense to do otherwise is if you're aiming for a life in politics and you know that at some point your taxes will probably be made public and you want to be perceived as someone who is legally pure rather than someone who is economically opportunistic and taking advantage of unfair loopholes. This is certainly not a universally held belief, but I don't think there are very many people who honestly believe that bureaucrats will better spend their money than they will. That, in most cases, most people would probably prefer to spend that money on a non-governmental non-profit, or on an investment in a business that aligns with their ideals, or even just giving their money to someone who they think could use it in a way that they consider to be valid and good, giving that money directly rather than having it go through the tax system. Now, if taking advantage of a flawed tax system is smart, because of the reasons I just mentioned, couldn't we say the same about taking advantage of a flawed regulatory system of any kind? Say, for instance, being able to legally grayball city officials to keep them from regulating your business by summoning and then punishing your drivers via your app. Or what about concealing evidence of rampant sexism within your workplace? There are laws that temper some of these things, but when those laws don't directly hinder your specific advantages, and when you believe wholeheartedly in what you are doing as a business in the big picture, doesn't it make sense to make use of that system and any loopholes you can find to get the best possible outcome for the path that you are blazing? even if that means overlooking the potential short-term ethical downsides of doing so. Doesn't it make sense, in other words, to ensure that you continue to have the resources and the wherewithal to move toward the world you want to see idealistically, the same as you might with the money you saved from a tax loophole, but in this case by propagating a system that, although flawed, allows you to replace the existing systems that you perceive to be even more flawed. It's about holding on to resources. It's about holding on to power of some kind in order to make changes that you consider to be more important than the downsides that you perpetrate in the pursuit of them. There was a great piece published on the website Stratechery earlier this month, and I'll link to that article in the show notes. What I like about Stratechery is that rather than simply covering new tech devices and the companies behind them from the consumer standpoint, the author actually regularly digs deeper into what these new devices and developments mean for the economy and for society and for the world, the legal and government implications of them. And in this particular piece, entitled The Uber Conflation, the issue of 
the spirit of the law is discussed, as in, Uber often operates to the letter of the law, but not in the spirit of the law. What this means is that companies like Uber tend to make sure they're doing exactly what the law states they have to do, but nothing more than that. And as a result, they get away with things that other companies wouldn't try because many other companies are adhering to the intention of the law, the reality that those laws are meant to create, while Uber and its ilk are comfortable saying, okay, this law is meant to ensure the mass transit industry doesn't collapse, but we can adhere to its exact tenets while still collapsing the taxi infrastructure by building our business to these exact specifications. This is why the company is so ardent, by the way, in framing itself as an app that allows drivers to orchestrate their own private little businesses, rather than framing themselves as a business that hires drivers. To do otherwise would run them afoul of the very laws that they are so carefully skirting. In doing so, they're avoiding myriad additional fees and regulations that similar but not similar enough companies are forced to adhere to, like the taxi companies. There's a really great line in this piece, which refers to toxic corporate culture, and particularly the corporate culture in tech companies that rewards being cutthroat and which doesn't punish abuse. Quote, culture is the accumulation of decisions reinforced by success, and Uber has collectively made a lot of decisions that pushed the line and been amply rewarded, end quote. That, to me, describes not just a lot of companies, but a lot of people who manage to adhere to the letter of the law and even some social mores while breaking with convention over the spirit of what was intended by those laws and social norms. If they do well, they will be largely forgiven for all the throats that they had to slit on the way up because of the successes that they can claim as a consequence of those actions which are often perceived to be negative actions. Later in this piece, the author zooms outward a bit, looking at the larger Silicon Valley startup world culture. Quote, We've created a world that simultaneously celebrates rule-breaking and undervalues women and minorities, full of investors and companies that are utterly ruthless when money is on the line, while cloaking said ambition in fluff about changing the world. That's the sad irony of the situation. Changing the world is exactly what Uber is doing. For all his mistakes, Kalanick has been one of the most effective CEOs tech has ever seen. End quote. There's more in that piece about the business side of Uber and what's happening there, and also what's unfortunate about an industry where CEOs are celebrated based on their numbers, while their immense and brazenly obvious character flaws are ignored. But the thread throughout the piece is the push-pull of different types of wrongness, and how being wrong in some ways and in some places can be right in other ways and other places, or at least the perception of these things can shift depending on how you're looking at it and where you are looking at these actions from. I personally would not be comfortable tricking someone into spending their money on a pyramid scheme, but for someone else, multi-level marketing gimmicks might make perfect sense. To them, perhaps the way they intend to spend the money that they fleece from their unsuspecting victims justifies the trickery and half-truths or mistruths that are required to make that fleecing work. Or perhaps their philosophy allows them to morally justify anything that helps them attain more wealth and power, regardless of how they intend to spend that wealth and power. Let's take that line of thought a step further for the purpose of intellectual clarity. Can you imagine a situation in which stealing is the morally correct choice? How about a situation in which stealing food is the morally correct choice? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a situation in which it is not just prudent, but morally correct to steal food from someone else? Now, some people might say, no, never. Stealing is clearly wrong in all situations, regardless of the circumstances. If you are starving, there are no doubt other ways to feed yourself. Do not create another victim the person you stole from, 
and then try to justify it away by pointing at your own selfish needs. But others might view that perspective as naive. There are all kinds of situations in which stealing might be the only alternative to dying. And if living is your intent because you intend to do something with your life, or just because to you life is a good thing and superior to death, that then might be the moral choice, even if it requires immorality to achieve it. Think about a war zone where all the grocery stores and all the crops have been destroyed, and the only food in the region is being hoarded by one person who has a hundred times what they personally need to survive. Would it be wrong to steal food from that person to feed yourself if it is the only way that you are going to continue to live? What about stealing food from that person with all that food to feed someone else, maybe your little brother? What about stealing it for a stranger and her family? Would it be okay to steal from that hoarder in that war zone to feed your pet dog? How about a stray kitten? Or how about this? What if you are stealing to feed yourself, but in doing so, you would be taking the only food possessed by your victim? They do not have a hundred times what they need. They have only exactly enough to survive themselves. In stealing that food, in saving your own life, you would be, in effect, killing them. Is that still legitimate, morally? And if not, where is the line? At what step along that progression do you stop and choose to die or let someone else die rather than stealing? And how should you feel about crossing that line, wherever it happens to be? What do you do with that knowledge? These questions, of course, all refer to extremes, and hopefully these scenarios will remain just thought experiments for most of us. But extremes are valuable in helping us test the veracity of our own ideals and biases. It's easy to say stealing is never okay if you assume there will always be other ways to get food. But if there's legitimately not, if there's absolutely zero opportunities to get food other than stealing, then these moral absolutes we cling to become a lot wobblier. They become a lot less certain. And it's through the lens of extremes that we can test the resiliency of our beliefs. It is nice to be able to say, in absolutely every situation, X, Y, and Z, but this belies the complexity of reality. It's easy to philosophize from an ivory tower, but the real world is made from a complex palette of gray tones. Now, pulling this back around to the topic of Uber and other organizations, it is wonderful if they provide us with value, with positive change, but at what cost? Where is the line? How much pure, unadulterated jerkdom should we tolerate before we topple a leader? And how much should we allow their actions and the benefits provided by those actions to assuage the consequences of their negative behavior? How do we compare values of this kind? When our default value metric, that of money, fails to account for things like emotional and physical abuse, of toxic but not quite illegal work environments, of general casual douchebaggery on the part of a powerful person, and even things that seem like they should be measurable but which are not really measurable in very useful ways, like the collapse of load-bearing traditions and conventions within a given industry, like within the taxi cab industry. It is worth our time to learn to measure these things, at least on a personal level and at least using individual metrics, because it allows us to better gauge how our biases are influencing our perception of something that is happening in the world and that is shaping a lot of the changes that we're seeing day to day. The truism that dictators at least make the trains run on time might actually be true in some cases, but for most people, the downsides of dictatorship outweigh the benefits of a predictable commute. Learning how we each prioritize these oversteps from personal impropriety all the way up to epic misdeeds allows us to weight our responses appropriately and discuss what's happening with each other 
without being shocked or outraged by how other people respond to these same variables and how they measure them according to their own personal standards. Global scale polluters might represent the ultimate in criminality to me, while child abusers might be the pinnacle of horribleness to you. By understanding where our biases reside, we can still discuss how to make things better with people who plant their priority flag in different places, which is favorable, I think, to simply talking over each other or stomping away in disbelief at someone else's obvious ethical misalignment, at someone else placing their values and lines in the sands in different places than us. We still need to have these conversations, but we are often prevented from doing so in a calm, logical, productive manner because not everyone has the same goals and priorities or the exact same goals and priorities that we do. They might place differing importance on some of the things that we find to be most vital. We can have a discussion about sexism, about questionable business practices, about CEOs with personality flaws, and about legal overstepping without trying to use any one of these issues to cover up other aspects of the stories. And that means both positive and negative aspects of the story. These diverse pieces of the puzzle can all be relevant. Along with the horrible stuff, we should discuss the potential benefits created by this flawed company, this flawed CEO, and the flawed people working under him. And likewise, as we discuss the massive revenues, the amazing inventions, and the positive changes being made in the world, we should absolutely be discussing the allegations of abuse, the history of malpractice, the indications of tyrannical tendencies. To leave any of these pieces out is to ignore vital data for the sake of caricature or convenience. And that may be satisfying on some level. It might sate our desire to punish or to hero worship, depending on which extreme we favor. But it keeps us from being fully informed and from acting appropriately based on the complete, complex, grayscale picture. All opportunities have costs, and we have the power to decide whether these costs are worth paying for the benefit gained. The more capable we are of clearly and completely discussing these matters, the more capable we become of recognizing, assessing, and determining the appropriateness of these costs when compared to what we get in return. From there, we can figure out whether to pay the costs, whether to extract our support from a given entity or movement, and whether there are other purveyors of the same or similar who we might invest in instead, who have fewer negatives but achieve similar positives. This is true on the personal level with every exchange we participate in, but it scales up to the societal level as well. It's most ideal that we have these discussions with an open mind, a refined sense of purpose, and a focused intentionality. If you are picking up what I'm putting down here on the show, consider stopping by letsnotethings.com. There, in addition to the copious show notes for each episode and the newsletter subscription form that you can sign up for if you care to receive a collection of interesting things in your inbox every Monday, you will also find a contribute page where you will find an array of different ways that you can help contribute to the propagation of the show. You can leave a review up on iTunes. You can share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it or with your social media audience. You can contribute directly, monetarily, or you can check out our sponsors, the first of which today is Audible. Audible is a massive audiobook library. If you enjoy podcasts, you will probably enjoy audiobooks. It took me a while to come around to these and figure out where they fit in my life, as I'm a huge fan of reading the printed page. But now that I have discovered them and worked them into my routine, I simply cannot get enough of them. I love the hell out of audiobooks. And Audible has a massive collection of audiobooks to choose from. Now, if you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free 30-day trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice, any book in their collection. And there are something like 200,000 of them, I think. And if you are lacking a book to spend that credit on, might I suggest 
Revelation Space by Alastair Reynolds. Revelation Space is the first book in a sprawling series called the Revelation Space series. And I just finished the entire series, actually. You can read the Revelation Space collection if you want all, I want to say, seven books in one book. But it is a bit of a journey to get there. These are great big chunky tomes. And the Revelation Space is the beginning of a massive space opera, essentially a tale that spans hundreds of years. It spans centuries, actually thousands in some of the books. And it follows characters in a universe in which the galaxy has been explored to a limited degree by humanity. And we've spread out and we've encountered mostly ruins of alien species and not really other aliens, with very few exceptions. And they're not aliens that we would consider thinking creatures in the same way that we are thinking. But it's at a tipping point where we discover that there's a little bit more going on than we thought. There's a reason why there's not a lot of other thinking creatures out there that we can easily discover. And this discovery serves as kind of a focal point around which the entire series orbits. The book, like most really satisfying space operas, has a solid combination of character and storyline and interesting plot twists but it also does a great deal of exploration into what it means to be human, into how our mythologies and our cultural storylines are created, into what might happen as a result of the development of certain types of technology, and things of that nature. Really big picture, interesting concepts that would be difficult to explore in an interesting, compelling, memorable way through anything but fiction. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, it's worth checking out Revelation Space by Alistair Reynolds. You can get this book at your local library, your local indie bookstore. You can grab it on Amazon, get it for your Kobo or your Kindle. Or if you care to, you can go to audibletrial.com LKT, get your free credit, and spend it on this book. As I mentioned, you can find the show notes and subscribe to the newsletter at letsnotethings.com. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. There you will find, among other things, a list of all of the books that I've written. You can find me personally pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.